Okay. Let's make a move then. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's kind of funny nowadays that we're doing these every fortnight and it feels like ages between when we were doing it weekly. Uh, but it's great to see so many familiar faces back again this week and thank you all for coming. I do strongly suspect it's because of this topic. You know, we kind of, at the end of the last one, stumbled onto this topic and realised that it was probably a really relevant one. And I think especially because nowadays, if you look at job boards, um, UX seems to be something that pops up quite frequently within that. And, you know, I personally think that there's still potentially a bit of misconception around what UX is and isn't. And also, I guess, for a lot of people who have been solely print designers over time, how do they actually start to make that transition into the world of UX? Um, now, we do have a, a fantastic guest speaker today, Ben Stephen Walker. Um, I met Stephen many years ago uh, when he was just leaving the print world and starting to move into the UX world. And I know when I reached out to a few places to ask if they would be um, available, one, one particular person said to me, you really need to talk to Steve Walker. And I was like, oh yeah, of course. I remember this gent and, and how good he was as well. Um, and Steve has very kindly said that yes, he would gladly um, offer some time today just to talk to us about this UX world. Um, a bit of a, a background on you, Steve. I, I, you flew were a lead instructor at Academy Z. Is it pronounced Academy Z or Academy Z? Yeah, so yeah, I've done a whole bunch of teaching before on um, some for Academy XI and some for General Assembly mm -hmm. and I've run my own HCD design thinking courses as well for clients and and other type of um, you know, smaller classes as well. Yeah. But, um, um, I was about to say you're sorry, currently a strategic design lead with a fairly well-known financial institution <laughs> as well. So you're not just yep. teach it, you, you are absolutely walk in the walk every day within the industry. Um, so what we thought we'd do is perhaps give Steve an opportunity just to chat, but make it very much a QA and a kind of forum. So if you do have any questions, feel free to type them through. Vanessa and I will be able to field them and at appropriate times be able to, um, to see if Steve has a, a comment to make on that. Uh, everyone good with that? Yay, awesome. Um, Steve, I can <coughs> hand it over to you if you like. Yeah, great. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me to do this. I think um, one of the things I'm always willing to give up my time to, you know, to talk about my experience of career transitioning between different design disciplines. And, you know, I think that it's kind of an, inev an inevitable decision for a lot of print designers. Um, I came to that realisation you know, after a long, I guess, 10 to 13 years of working in sort of print design. I was primarily in sort of art direction and publishing for most of my career. But, you know, as most designers, you probably just freelance everywhere and done everything and anything in between. Um, but I think the, the good news is there's lots of transferable skills that you can take from traditional design yeah, into lots of digital design disciplines, which yeah, hopefully I can shed some light on, you know, the experience I've had, um, you know, talk to you about trying to clean up, clear up some of the confusion around the word design and what people think that means now, which is getting more and more confused as we, as we kind of progress day to day. But I've got my thoughts on that, which should um, simplify that for people a little bit. And then we'll just talk about, um, <coughs> some of the key themes that, that, you know, I think we can discuss for our Q&A. So um, if there's any questions, I'll just kick it off and do a bit of an intro session and then we'll go straight into the discussion. Great. I just wanted to start off quickly. If everyone can put their um, microphones on mute and so then we get a nice, clear, crisp voice from Stephen. <laughs> or else we'll have to release the dogs. Yeah, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Thanks, go for it. I'm just going to share this. Cool. Can everyone see that? Great. All right. So, um, yeah, if you want to have a quick squeeze at what um, I've got my website up there. If anyone wants to have a look, you can see the kind, kind of work I've been doing. I've got it all on there. 
Um, I'll look back on it at the end though, in case anyone wants to write that down. But first of all, I wanted to touch on, you know, it's clarifying what's the confusion around the word design and probably something you've all been experiencing and trying to grapple with about, you know, trying to transition your career, but, you know, to what? Because everyone's got a different definition of what design is and what UX means and all the discussions you, you see people having all the time. I think it, a lot of the time it's people overcomplicating things because of a lack of understanding of what they actually, they're actually asking for in the industry. So I think this infographic is a great way. I've used this before in other sessions that I've done with teaching about just setting, setting um, up that conversation in a way to say that yeah, all of these things can be called design. And I think that's what the source of some of the confusion in industry is all about is that you know, if you broke all of those things down, which this infographic comes from a guy called Dan Saffer, who you know, is a bit of a thought leader in the UX space. Um, I think he communicates it quite well. And if you see when you break up all these different <clears throat> core skill sets, you know, everything within this sort of realm here, right, could actually be called user experience design. But within that, there's so many different specialities. Um, all of these things can be broken up into different types of jobs. You know, people can choose to specialize in certain things. You can be a bit, bit of an all-rounder or, you know, specialize in a few of these things. But I think that, um, you know, one of the things that you'll grapple with, right, is different employers and different types of people will have different ideas of what they think design means and the definition of that. And the answer is it's everything. <laughs> but it's more about, you know, how you position yourself and what skills you, you have and the way you present them and fit into a workplace and... Um, But yeah, we can talk more about that. I think that's going to be a pretty good topic of conversation at the end. I think the more important thing for you guys is to actually choose what path you want to take through this confusion. So I think the great thing about coming from a print design background is you've got a lot of transferable skill sets that can be applied directly to digital design and user experience design. I think one of the things that really worked well for me because I was from a kind of print design background, but for publishing, I was used to coming up with, you know, frameworks and structures and design patterns, almost like, you know, systems thinking. So all that is really easily transferable to designing components and design patterns for you know, interaction design and websites. Um, I did some time when I, in my early on in my career designing and wayfinding systems, so signage systems and things like that, which again, it's a similar kind of transferable skill set, which, yeah, it really set a good foundation um, that I still use today in the way I think about navigation. Uh, the other thing that is really worth talking about as well is that with you know, all of these things being called design now and all of these roles overlapping. One of the things that becomes really important about being successful is your ability to collaborate with all these different types of roles. So I think that's one of the, the biggest mindset shifts that needs to happen. And when I think about what I used to, how I used to operate as a print designer, where it was, you know, mostly a solo effort with a few clients to, to deal with. Now, you know, I'll, I'll be in meetings and have to directly collaborate with teams of like 20, 25 people, all different types of roles, multiple stakeholders. So it's, it's um, yeah, there's a lot of work there to, I call it kind of, finding ways to have an effective collaboration with people. So you need to find a shared language. Um, one of the things that 
that makes it easier to have those conversations because you know, if you if you think of all of these different things that are trying to do design the common thing about all of them is that it's for a person it's for a, an end user so if you talk about you know objectively around the insights you've gotten from who these end users are and you're designing from an understanding of what their needs and pain points are that, you know, becomes the shared language that helps you collaborate with all these different types of jobs. <clears throat> um, one of the big shifts that you'll need to, to make, um, you know, designs like UX design or user centered, centered design. It's not about you and it's not about, you know, your sort of creative craft anymore, which is a bit of a, a leap where you've got a, you know, that becomes less important. Whereas, you know, the craft of being a print designer is often you know, one of the higher priorities that changes quite significantly when you're designing things that need to be functional and that are you know, objective and based on user insights and objective data. Um, I like to show this video. I'll see if this works. I probably need to sh stop sharing this and share my um my screen. Yeah. Tell me if this doesn't work because the audio might not come through. Let's watch this quick video here. Yeah, it sounds like we have a bit of an issue with the audio there. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yeah. It won't bother it bother with that then. I'm sure most people have probably seen that episode. It's a great video and, it's, and <laughs> it, it really does show you user experience. I think it's fantastic. So if anyone wants to look it up later, please do. You'll get a laugh out of it. Could you share the yeah. URL with us? Yes, totally. Hang on. Let me just... Um... Oh, Cassis has already put the uh, URL in the comments. So grab a copy of that if yeah, you cool. want to guy. Yeah, so I think what it, what this video communicates quite well is, you know, Homer finds finds his long lost brother who owns a car company and gives Homer the job to design his new flagship car. And Homer just the way he approaches it is he just puts everything that he thinks is cool based based on his, you know, what he, he wants in the car. And it ends up to be just this mess of cool features that because he hasn't consulted anybody and he ended up, you know, unveiling this car and ruins his brother's company because um, that's the result of it. But I suppose what that communicates, right, is that you need to shift from sort of designing from, from your own experience to designing, you know, um, to sort of serve other people and for functional purpose as well. All right, so we'll talk quickly about this here, which I think um, is really important because I like to talk about um, you know, setting realistic expectations, but also from a lot of the teaching that I've done and seeing a lot of um, like capability of uplift programs within different corporates that I've worked at is you see this repeated you know, quite often. And I think it's a, a good thing to be mindful of when you're having a, you know, when you're completely transitioning to a new skill set or learning something new. Um, this is often what kind of happens to people. So people get really excited <clears throat> and they learn a lot of new things. So their confidence level shoots up because they think they've got all the answers and they want to go out and apply this, this stuff that they've learnt. So you get this peak of extreme confidence and excitement. And then you start sort of realizing over time, you know, okay, maybe I don't know everything. And, and, you know, I went through this process as I'm sure everyone does when you learn a new skill, but I think it's good just to be mindful and aware of this is that, you know, you need to be filling those knowledge gaps and not assuming that you've got a lot of the answers. 
I think it's incredibly important for for people that are already have already gotten to quite a senior level in your career, which I was like that before I switched over. So you're already at the pinnacle, you're operating at that level, you're um you know, having like sort of senior strategic conversations about you know, print design with people. But then when you switch careers, you you'll have some pretty significant knowledge gaps that you need to make up. And I like to think of my journey, I would say that it took me a good about three years or so from when I first started, when I first switched um, into a more UX focused role until, you know, I could hand in my heart say that I was pretty competent and knew what I was doing. So I was kind of faking it till I made it a little bit at the beginning, which I think everyone sort of has to do that. But I think doing it with awareness is the takeaway. Okay, so that was my little intro. I wanted to keep it more focused on finding out the kind of things you guys had questions about. I've put some conversation starters here, which I thought were some of the important themes that we might want to talk about. But if you've got other stuff that is more pressing, please offer that up and do my best to answer it. I think, I think I'll, I'll jump in and ask. So we're dueling. Sorry. Jeez, we're eager to ask the questions. <laughs> We've got so many questions. Lawrence, yeah. you go first. I think the, one of the ones that we probably hear the most from people is if they've had a, a successful career as a print designer or working predominantly in print, mm -hmm. what things can they do right now to start making that transition? Now, what would be the first step that they would need to do right now to start making that transition more into the world of UX? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the, so I'll flip back to this, this thing here, right? So I think one of the, the easiest pathways will be first, you know, sitting down and doing a bit of an audit of what your current skill sets were mm -hmm. and what are the things that directly translate to a UX role. So I'd say that most of what you'd be looking at, right, would be the interaction design and interface design realm. Yeah, I think that's what most people associate with UX as well when they when yeah. they think of UX in the traditional sense. Yep. So so the things that you would be wanting to do first is yeah, you know, if you want to transition into a role like that, the kind of roles that you could potentially get into would be a, a more UI UX focused role, mm -hmm. which would most likely be more more kind of production focused. So designing you know, components and um sort of optimization type design maybe mm -hmm. with where you just be, um, you're not having to reinvent the world and design new, new products and, and things like that. You could, the easier pathway would be to get into a more, you know, BAU focused role where you'd have a bit more chance to, to just go about your BAU work and start learning from other people around you that, or more experience in that field, I think. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's VAU? Sorry. So uh, business as usual type work. So, so if you know you were you went into a larger corporate or something like that's what I did when I first transitioned. I got a gig at Australia Post, and you know I loved the stuff I was working on initially. It was all just you know pretty, pretty mundane stuff like EDM templates, you know banners for the website and things like that. But, you know, pretty quickly, as I started skilling up and getting exposed to some of the more advanced skill sets and getting involved in doing user research and, you know, um, starting to get involved in designing the, the design component libraries for the website, you know, I started moving out of the more, more junior type work pretty quickly and started getting into the more advanced stuff. But Definitely my foot in the door came from literally just doing you know, actual interaction design, UI design work, first up. Okay. And then the that, question, sorry, the, sorry, the question that I then wanted to ask is, 
um, what sort of formal training can you get? So where, where is that, you know, can, can that be done online? Is there something that we can do without paying a lot of money for a course or a course that goes for a really long time? What are the, what are the sort of um, advice that you can give for most of these people that are actually print designers? Yeah, so, so the way I did it, you know, I, um, I kind of blagged my way into my first role a little bit and then sort of learned while I was there. But then also pretty quickly after that when um, I was trying to transition to a, into a more, more of a strategic UX role, I actually went to General Assembly and did their um, you know, uh, you know, UX design course which was the first one that when the GA first came to Australia and that was helpful for me and just um, sort of filling some of the knowledge gaps and made me, gave me a more well-rounded understanding of the things that I didn't know already. I think that that's what, that's what was really helpful for me. Cause it just, I wouldn't, it wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I finished that course as an expert ready to go. It was just, um, it just gave me a good awareness of the things I needed to learn more about and gave me some initial, initial sort of exposure to some of those things. But then after that point, there was a heap of self-learning that I had to do to actually get myself up to the level that I, that I needed to be. And I think that's going to be the same thing for everyone here is that, yeah, there won't be, there won't be just like a course or something that's you can just easily just do and learn everything you need to know. It's going to be a process over time, just like learning anything, right? It's like you don't pick up a guitar and know how to play it straight away. Yep. You give yourself three years or something. Just a quick, quick one, Stephen, how would you yep. actually define in your mind um, UX design? Yeah, so I think that, yeah, a, an actual UX role, it should be focused on more, more of the functional experience of building products, less around the, the detailed interaction design of, you know, the visuals and stuff. So you'd often, yeah, in, in a, an actual, what I think would be a purist UX role, yeah, you wouldn't be working in anything else other than just wireframes and you know, boxes and text, keeping things really low fidelity. You would be yeah, actively in, involved in testing concepts and iterating things with user testing. And then you'd be working collaborative, collaboratively with your know, technical people to help you, help you go through that process, you know, business stakeholders, you would be in a position where you'd probably be working with more, more sort of visual interaction design focused people, but they would be doing a, a lot more of the detailed inter interaction design work. Does that kind of answer your question a bit more? Yeah, I'm just wondering if you've got like a, a, a typical kind of project or, you know, cause I, I actually thought UX really just meant websites only, but seems to be more than that. Yeah. So I think that's, it's kind of why, um, yeah, it, it is confusing. Right. And it's why I use this to have that intro discussion with people is because, you know, one stakeholders, um, you know, idea of what a UX designer does might just be, uh, a UX designer makes my, um, webpage look nice for me, which is an incorrect view of what a UX designer should be. But the, the thing the point I'm trying to get across to you guys is that it is really subjective and it's almost up to you to, to kind of define what you want to be doing rather than waiting for someone else to tell you what they think you should be doing. So I think that's, it's more important to just find your own path and what the way you want to work and position yourself in a place that with people that are doing things the way that you think you want to work as well. Um, some questions here um, about uh, software programs. So do you, mm -hmm. 
prefer Sketch, um, Envision, or Adobe XD, or even Figma? Or is there anything that you have a preference for? Uh, when, when I was, I guess, about five or six years ago, everyone was primarily using Axure, it's A-X-U-R-E. Um, that kind of got blown out of the water when things like Sketch came along, which were made much easier to use. But, you know, the thing that was good about Axure is you could put all conditional logic into the prototype so that when you had typed actual data in, it would calculate the right amounts and forms and things like that, which is a limitation of things like Sketch, which are more just visual and they don't have that kind of logic in there. But you know, primarily what I use most mostly now is a combination of Sketch and Envision and then collaboration tools like Zeppelin to work together with developers that basically breaks up all your sketch files and turns it into CSS code that you can share with them so they can actually build the components for you. Yeah, that, that's my main sort of tools. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of people rave about Figma, but I've just never, never had to switch over. I just use what, what works for me. Uh, Can those programs also be dependent on what the client has, or is it usually the designer that's driving <laughs> that uh, decision? Yeah, it's probably just what they've got license for in the place that you're working at. I know that Latitude has Sketch. That's what's the light they've got the license for. So everyone uses Sketch at my current workplace. Um, Jody's asked, do you have some examples of both UX and UI projects you have worked on? I guess that might come back to your um, website that you mentioned at this very start of the presentation. Yeah, so, um, so thinking of, yeah, I could just share. Hang on. Probably easier if I just show you. <clears throat> cool. You guys see that? Mm hmm. All right, so what I've done here, so I think this is um, going to be connected to another thing I want to talk to you about as well, about how to position yourself for the type of work that you want to be doing because you know, I've purposely left off a lot of more UI-focused work off my website because that's not the type of work I want to be doing. I'm more focused on you know, earlier sort of strategic design work nowadays. You know, let's say that when I first started out, a lot of the typical work that I was doing that was more UI focused was, you know, I was kind of more at the end of the line in the production of the design components and things like that. So I don't really have any examples on here that I could show you where it's like a pure UI design project. A lot of the work I do here is more I guess at the early stage of a project where I guess this, this is a good one where it, it's probably the best example I can find of something that it was a full end to end pro process where I did everything from, you know, specking the work, doing the UX wireframing work, but then I took it all the way through to the finished design components, which you can see here. I'll explain really quickly kind of what this process looked like. So, I got sent in to census. They had a, um, it was a company I was working for at the time called IE and they had a retainer that they were just trying to run out with census. So they just sent me there for four weeks and said, just basically go and they've got some thing they want you to work on. I was like, cool. Knew nothing about it. Walked in there. Some devs had built this API to do screen scraping on social media accounts. And I was like, cool. So help me understand what's, what's this supposed to be for? What, uh, I don't know. We don't really know. We just want to build this thing. And I was like, cool. Well, let's go and speak to the people that are going to have to use this, which was the sales consultants. Went talk to them about what they did in their job. Understood that, you know, the way that they were 
or the things I was doing before they called clients. So bringing up things like we rank and comparing different clients with other, so they're comparing, you know, Joe blogs, plumbing versus, you know, this other plumbing company and seeing which like the best practice guys were doing and then using that to basically have a sales conversation with people about, Oh, you should do this, 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 and this. And then they're selling their social media kind of, um, uh, they had like all these services that they were selling through census to uplift people's um, ranking on social and SEO and such. So based on what we understood there, we redesigned this, this wireframe together with the sales guys, you know, worked out what would be useful to prompt that sales discussion, came up with this dashboard where it gave comparative rankings with different companies, websites they put in there. And then that all got signed off. We iterated it with those sales guys a couple of times. And then I took all their brand components libraries. So I got all these assets, they're all existing and they're all in bits and pieces. And I had to rejig them all around on the screen and do the detailed design. And then I'd handed this over to developers and we worked together and they built it. So this was a good, a good project, a really rapid project that was done within a couple of months and being used, but it was a full end to end design process. So the actual UI component of that, if you just had a, you know, a specialist UI job, you wouldn't be doing all of the consultative UX work up front, like this stuff here, you would just be focused on just the detail of how it looks and these kind of UI components, or if you're like, you know, doing the entire process, all of this would be included. Or if you were just doing the UX, you'd just do this and then hand it over to somebody. Does that make sense? Can I ask, um, when you're doing the, um, the prototyping, how do you know what is possible? Because um, there must come a time when it's like, oh, this is really technical. I wonder if we can do it. Is that when you'd actually speak to, you know, do you have close collaboration with the coding people, or do you have a bit of knowledge there yourself, which you know how far you can push something? Yeah, so so with experience, you get to know the restrictions that you're, the parameters that you can work within. So you don't design your crazy stuff that's impossible to build, but also it becomes really important, right, that you're in a position where you can collaborate and with people because it's much easier to, you know, you have, have this saying that it's you know, easier to use an eraser on the drawing board than to take a sledgehammer to the building. You, know, you don't want to spend months, months designing some perfect thing and then take it to a developer and they're like, well, you can't do any of that. It's you'd, easier just to have a one conversation and draw something on a whiteboard in five minutes. And, you know, it's kind of goes back to what I was saying about how important it is to, to change your mindset and be more collaborative and you know, ask questions where you don't know. Um, but yeah, it's the answer is yes. You just have to be more collaborative. And if you don't know the answers to those things, you need to go and ask it. Sorry if I could ask you questions. Stephen. Um, yeah, sure. I, I actually am also coming out of general assembly. I'm doing a part-time course, uh, UX design mm -hmm. with them. And obviously it's end to end is coming right from your problem all the way down to UI. Um, yep. for someone, uh, for someone who wants to get into UX, I come from motion design and graphic design. Uh, would it, is it, is it a good idea to post, your case study, like the, the one case study I have on your website as a portfolio, giving everything you know, or should I be aiming for something specific like UX or UI? Yeah, so this is a really interesting one because I found this was a, um, a real, really problematic when I first was trying to transition careers because, because I had, yeah, a, you know, comprehensive design, experience in a portfolio with all, all sorts of you know, branding and publishing design work on my, you know, that I put in my resume or my was online. 
and actually found that that was actually worked against me when I was trying to go for UX roles because I think that, you know, people are looking for an easy, you know, sort of square peg in a square hole solution when they're trying to hire people. So from my experience, it's a lot harder to convince somebody that you can do more than one thing, when I'm, which is annoying because it shouldn't be like that because it should be a plus, but just be aware that that was actually hindering me getting, getting interviews. And then I found that it actually turned completely around when I just removed all my graphic design stuff completely off. I took it down off the website and just rewrote my resume and everything and rewrote a thing and just put UX case studies in there. And then that was easier for me to get interviews after that. If I could just follow that up, if possible, is it, is it inadequate to have just one case as study in your portfolio or do you really need more than one or two? I think you could probably find that if you went back with some of your motion design work, you could probably, you know, reverse engineer some of those things and turn it into a bit of a UX case study. Cause I'm sure there's some things, there's elements of it, you know, where if you rethought it about the way you approached it, I think what people, what's more important to, to communicate is the thought process and yeah, where it's, you know, with, Traditional design used to be more about, you know, showing the quality of the end product, and that's what people were looking for. But I think with UX work and more strategic design stuff, people are looking for the process more. So if you can just rethink how you actually position yourself, but it's, it's kind of about selling yourself in a different way. And yeah, you know, a lot of those skill sets that you've got are completely transferable to UX roles. So it's more just about um, being clearer around how you talk about what you want to do, basically. Thanks for that. Uh, I think that's a, a really good response as well, because I know from a recruitment perspective, when we're talking to clients and they're after someone who's a specialist, they really want to mm -hmm. be able to see someone who has got um, that focus or that niche. And I think sometimes mm. when there is, um, when you're a bit of someone who's been across a lot of things, despite the fact that that's just expanding your skill set and offering more, from yeah. a perception perspective, people might go, oh, maybe they're not actually that specialist in that area because they've been through so much. It's ridiculous, mm. but I think that's often some of the things we kind of face there with that. Yeah. So it might just be a case of, you know, just taking it on a case by case basis, you know, depending on who you are, um, you have a few different versions of your resume, for different kind of scenarios, maybe. But yeah, that's definitely a good piece of advice that. Yeah. I also think it's a good piece of advice for Lawrence and I, when we actually have those roles to say to the client, what do you want to see? Mm. What, you know, and then being able to, to communicate that to, to, Everybody saying the client does want to see this. And then it's not, you know, Lawrence or I or another recruiter trying to block you from getting to that job. It's just like, this is what the client wants to see. So, um, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Thanks for that, Stephen. Yeah, it makes your jobs quite difficult too, because I've been contracting for quite a long time now. And a lot of the process before I take on new contracts is I always go really deep and um, interrogate new clients about what they actually think they want because, you know, position description might read really well because, yeah, they might have gotten it from somewhere or copied another PD that I've seen and they think they want a UX designer. But, yeah, when you say, okay, well, what do you think that means? What's involved in doing that? Like, what are you trying to achieve? Like, what type of projects are you going to be doing? Yeah, and sometimes they, they might not even know what they want. 
Exactly, and that's what I was about to say. Sometimes we have people that that are asking for this, but then they don't know what it is themselves. It's it's Uh, almost like recruitment FOMO. Uh, (laughs) You know, it's kind of like, oh, everyone else has UX people. We have to get them, even though we don't know what they really are. Uh, (laughs) What do you want to see? UX stuff. Yes. What does that look like to you? I don't know. Show me. Adrian has asked a question uh, a little back uh, about what are the key UX elements you expect to see on a CV? And Jody's also asked a question which kind of ties into this, which is how much coding knowledge and ability should someone have if applying for a UX position? Yeah, so I'll start by with the coding one. So um, I think that's completely dependent on the type of company that you're working for and what they're after because... Mm -hmm. You know, if we look back at our kind of skill set um, thing, you know, one company's idea of what they need and what they think a UX person should be might be a combination of, you know, really someone who's really good at sort of interaction animation plus like being able to code that for native apps or something. It might be like an app design company. Then, yeah, you would need to, to be able to code. But, you know, another company which might be more just around um, discovery research and being able to do low-fidelity prototyping and having a more, you know, research um, sort of human factors and sort of usability testing stuff with a a sprinkling of UX might have absolutely no need for coding knowledge whatsoever. Mm. Um, It's completely dependent and changes depending on who you're working with but it's always good you know i would advise anyone yeah you should have at least a basic knowledge of of how coding works there's some um there's a really good free resource called dash at general assembly this is like a free coding course that covers all the basics of css html and some basic um the javascript stuff like at least, you know, go through something like that to so you at least know how to talk about it mm-hmm. and learn about how to how to understand, you know, responsive design patterns, you know, how to design um you know, if you understand the basis of how things work, you'll be able to be a better designer. Um, sorry, I forgot about the first part of that question. Well, the first was... question was about asking um what are the key UX elements you expect to see on a CV? And and that might be a more challenging one for you to, mm. to respond to because you don't necessarily look at CVs. But I guess if we were to flip that question around, it might be something along the lines of um, how, if you were to look at someone's background, how would you be able to ascertain if they were a good UX um, designer or not? Yeah. Well, the, the thing that I'd be looking for with somebody is, um, yeah, if it was someone that was kind of entering the industry or someone was new into the industry, I'd be more worried about looking at you know, their, if they're trying to go through the thought process in a good way. They were you know, just demonstrating some ability for lateral thinking, um, you know, looking for things that, that changed based on the insights they'd gotten from research. Um, also, I guess I'd want to see evidence of, you know, that they're going the extra mile to do self-learning. You know, you'd want to see those type of things to see that, you know, they actually get it and they're you know, trying to do, the, do it the right way is more important than, you know, kind of a couple of cool um, projects or, or, you know, just saying buzzwords. So you, you want to see you through. want to see substance over yeah. uh, the the the, uh, the meat and bones there. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I think to to answer all that that question also is to actually have a look at your website and show how you show your case studies. I think that's mm. great. You know, you, you that's all the language that you need and the process to follow and taking photos of your thought process of all the you know yeah. um, sticky notes. Um, that's how I always see a good case study for UX is their thought process of how it all worked out. Mm. Um, Yeah. So you want like, um, yeah, evidence of the process, evidence of collaboration, yeah, evidence of 
changing direction based on learning things. Mm, yeah. Right. And Michelle, does that answer your question? Sorry, we're going back a little bit here, but um, uh, talking about the shared language, what podcasts um, we've actually uh, recommended Dash at General Assembly. So does that answer your question, Michelle? Yes, thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, any other trick ones? We're ready. Got an expert. So I've sort of had, um, yeah, that, I think we've kind of covered a lot of those key points. I yeah, think absolutely. I what's really important is your last point there is setting yeah. the expectations of the actual yeah. journey that this is not going to be take a course and in a couple of months you'll be qualified. Um, I, th I think it's really important to set those mm. expectations that it's it's try and try again as with your um, you know uh, effect graph that you had that you're going to have your ups and downs and yeah. you're going to have to work through those and it's not. A small, um, it's not a small or short process. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the key thing is no matter what course you take in life, if you don't put it into practice, it's pretty much just been a waste of time. So I think it's really about how do you, you continue that education, but then how do you implement what you've just learned straight after that as well? Yeah, I think it's spot on, Lawrence. It's, um, yeah, you can read all the books and have all the theories and sound like you know what you're talking about but yeah. when you actually try to apply it and just flounder because you've got no experience to draw upon like absolutely people will find you out pretty quickly you can read so. a book on how to swim but it doesn't matter until you get into the pool that's it yeah so, yeah, it's... Simon, uh, hi i just wanted to ask you uh so correct me if i'm wrong uh, UI is uh, wireframing and UX is uh, experience, right? It can all be either. U basically. UI <laughs> is wireframing and uh, so, UX. So, so UI, UI is kind of think of it as the more detailed visual components. So it's okay. at the end of the process. Uh -huh. U UX is off more more often. Just working what in low fidelity, it? less worried about the details, um, working in more sort of lo-fi stuff so that you can throw it away and change it quickly. So it's oh, more okay. in the collaborative process where you, know, you don't want to be spending days and days you know, cre creating perfect wireframes. You want to be working in a format that you can break and test and change with quickly, whereas the UI speciality if you want to be a UI specialist you'd probably be more likely working on getting really tight and finished design patterns working on more in more of a like component library type of way mm -hmm. so you'd be mm -hmm. you know finessing all the icons so they're the same making sure there are certain treatments that are consistent consistent sort of typography treatments and spacing um, focus on you know just the real detail of the visual components and how they're applied and coming up with the rules. Like and look and see like. kind of a play thing. Yeah. But I guess okay. the difference between sort of how that, you know, how you would approach that from like a craft perspective as a print designer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Probably it's less, you don't have to worry as much about the, um, the repeated use of components like with a lot of print design because you're doing more sort of one-off things. But with like, if you're designing a component system for a product or a website or something, it's something that you're iterating all the time when new components get built, you're sort of working out how they fit into that system oh, that, you're, wow. that you're managing you. Yeah, so you can have like a, yeah, a UI focus role, which would be right in the detail that type of stuff if if that's what you wanted to put, specialize in there are jobs like so, that around so the coding will be will be coming in the u.s uh then, right uh not necessarily but you know you, you it all depends you know the some some places mix those kind of roles together some places have specialists yeah you could be a specialist um, front-end developer 
and mm -hmm. never have to design anything. You can just take requirements from people and build things if you want. But it's um it's mods around what you want to be doing and specializing in the things that you that you want to do. Sure. Thanks a lot. Sure. Uh, one more question here from Adrian. What's a good way of creating example case studies if you've never had a client in UX? And I suspect this might come back to what you were saying before about reverse engineering. <laughs> Um, mm. some of the work that you have done, which I thought was a great answer. So, yeah. So, yeah. And if you, if you find, if you do that and you find you're really struggling to, to do that with the work you've done previously, then the next thing I would advise you to do is get involved in anywhere where you could just do sort of, um, those kind of sessions where you can go and do design jams, volunteer to go and work with with somebody that you can use something as a ux case study but yeah you're going to need something you're going to need you know like proven examples of you applying the work for for people to give you a shot can i ask another question <laughs> mm -hmm. um how important in um a case study would mobile first like building up that way is that really critical or is it, um, is that more the UI side? Uh, so it's, so the kind of mobile first, like that, when people talk about that, it's more, that became a thing when basically people started designing responsive grid patterns and things like that. So it started, people started talking about that basically when I was kind of entering the UX industry you know, so back in 2011, 2012. And all it basically is, is, you know, you have, if you think of it, about it, like three different breakpoints. So you have the desktop size, mobile, uh, or like tablet size, which is like 768 pixels portrait. And then you go down to mobile, which, and all those screen sizes are completely different because there's a million, yeah, back when I first started doing UX, there was only a couple of mobile phones around and a couple of sizes. And now there's like hundreds because there's like millions of devices. So basically it's just more about working with flexible grid structures. So you'll have, so a three column, well, it'll be like a component that display, displays on desktop as a three column section. Then, um, on tablet, maybe it shrinks a little bit to fit within that thing. And then on mobile, it goes into a vertical thing where all those modules stack underneath each other. That's, that's all it is. It's basically just being aware of how your components stack and change when you hit those different device sizes. Is it important to show that in a case study or is that just like a, something that is just known? Okay, well, we're yeah, it's kind of, it's more just an expectation of how people work really um yes yeah if 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 people didn't weren't aware of it you'd probably notice pretty quickly but uh, yeah just it's just like that there's things like that that you'll just pick up when you start working like because people show you it or yeah you can just be aware of it through learning about it Okay, yeah. we're, we're coming up to uh, nearly an hour. So any other uh, questions that we can answer for you that burning questions for Stephen? Burning questions sounds like you need a doctor, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ointment for that, I'm sure. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, yeah. uh, that was just fascinating for me. Thank yeah, you so it changed much. my perception as well. I, I suddenly thought it was all, you know, digital and all that stuff, but I'm beginning to realise it's so much more. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's kind of everything. Yeah. <laughs> you can... which, is, which is funny because if someone came to me and said, what do you do? Or I asked what you do and they say, I do everything. I'd tell them off straight away. So yeah. <laughs> It's like, that's too vague. So, but the, in this case, it really does cover it. Yeah. Do you, uh, one last yeah. question. Do you find UX to be a satisfying career? Um, definitely when you find yourself in a position where you can apply it the right way, it's very satisfying. 
there's um you know it's there's i still run into problems as well like even even though i've, I've been um in the industry for quite some time now and i'm getting way more towards the pointy end of like the business strategy discussions and yeah you're always educating people you're always having to have the same conversations around um what people think you should and shouldn't be doing um there's a lot of roles that overlap with um especially when you get into strategic type of work is that's that's stuff that everyone wants to do so you end up having a lot of kind of you know tricky conversations around who owns what and who does what but you know when if i look at the sort of where i came from at the end of my print design career where i was kind of looking around going where to next so I'd, the print industry is kind of dying a bit publishing's dying i don't regret getting into this um different career yeah no yeah, i so think even so job boards career. job boards now prove you made the right decision based so i think that mm-hmm. every second job has some sort of ux component to it right yep. now um just before we we let everyone go what's your website again in case people want to go and have a, oh, yeah. a look at that just that just s walker strategic design.com um thank you so much for today steven um really do appreciate the fact you've been able to offer so much insight into yeah, this no problem. and I, I hope people found this really beneficial and useful yeah i'm happy to you know offer some of the um the stuff i've learned from going through this process and yeah, it's not easy and you'll have a lot of a lot of challenges but if you stick at it you know you can you can do it and you've got lots of skills already that are directly transferable you're already starting in a better place than mm-hmm. other people so Excellent. fantastic thank you so much and um yeah for everybody watching as you know we always uh, record this and have one later so if you've got friends that wanted to know what it was about, um, you can go back and have a look at this recording, which is great. Or even go back yourself again to pick up some notes. Yeah. And now that I have MBN, it'll probably be up later on today instead of like... Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and instead of when I had to find a gap between when my partner wanted to watch Netflix and I could upload. Yeah. Um, so that's good. And of course, remember, if, if you're not part of the... Um, Creative Recruiters Virtual Meetup Group on Facebook. That's a place where we stock all of these past presentations as well. Uh, Otherwise, we'll see everyone in a fortnight. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Cool. Thanks, guys. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye.